Good evening, everyone, to the and especially the esteemed faculty and audience. And I'm thrilled to welcome you all to this meeting called Pulmonology Forum. So Pulmonology Forum is a meeting which is conducted by GSK in collaboration with the Indian Chess Society. I would wholeheartedly like to welcome and thank the Indian Chess Society for collaborating with GSK, especially Dr. Amita Nene, who is the TEI for ICS and who has also taken great efforts for this meeting. Also, I would like to thank Dr. Sandeep Salvi, who is the president of ICS, and also Dr. Rajadar, who is the secretary for ICS. So this exciting event brings together leading experts like pulmonologists, radiologists, and healthcare professionals, and industry partners like GSK to foster collaboration and knowledge exchange in the vital field of lung health. So it, the Indian Chess Society, as we all know, is a renowned organization which is dedicated to respiratory health in India. And together, we aim to basically shine a light on latest advancements in pulmonary diagnosis, treatment, and patient care, and ultimately improve patient outcomes. So uh, I would also like to mention that there is a short poll there'll be two small poll questions for you which have only yes and no answers and these are basically just a feedback which will be initially a pre-poll and after the webinar there'll be a pre a post poll and it's just a short survey just to understand the clinical practice and how better we can uh, do a clinical practice for patient outcomes and at the end of the webinar, you will also get a feedback survey, which we will have to fill. So just to introduce Dr. Amita Nene, who will be moderating the event today. So she's the HOD of respiratory medicine at Bombay Hospital, Mumbai. So she's the program in charge and teacher in DNB respiratory medicine and MD and DNB examiner for pulmonology. She was awarded legend in pulmonology by the union minister, Dr. Jitendra Singh in July, 2023. She's an author of more than 50 publications and 12 chapters in pulmonary textbooks. She's the honorary secretary of the Indian Association of Bronchology. She's also the West Zone, West Zone chairperson of Thoracic Endoscopic Society of India and also a governing body member of the Indian Chess Society. Last but not the least, she's the recipient of the Young Achiever Award in the field of pulmonology. So basically our first speaker for the day is Dr. Bhavin Jankarya. He will be speaking in a very interesting topic of imaging in large airway diseases. So Dr. Jankarya is a partner and consultant at Picture This by Jankarya. Then he's an author of five books, 41 chapters, 76 articles, 36 posters in international journals and congresses. He has more than 1500 invited lectures over the past 30 years of his enormous career. He's the past editor in chief of the Indian Journal of Radiology and Imaging. He has his latest book published on computed tomography of interstitial lung disease. And he's also the past president of the Indian Association of Radiology, Imaging and Association. So this talk is going to be very exciting from Dr. Jankarya. So we will start with this talk first. Okay, Abhijit. Hi. Um, welcome to this lecture on imaging and large airway diseases. Uh, the focus really is going to be on COPD and bronchiectasis uh, uh, today. Uh, you can see the disclaimer here. And we'll start off with emphysema. And this is then divided into the patterns that we see in smokers and then in non-smokers. We usually see three patterns of emphysema morphologically we have centrilobular paraseptal and panlobular panlobular is quite uncommon in our country so i'm going to really just focus on centrilobular and paraseptal when we look at centrilobular emphysema we have these different uh, grades or stages of cle 
that we can appreciate on a CT. A trace centrilobular emphysema is when the lucency, which is next to the vessel, involves less than 0.5% of any one zone. Um, and this really implies very, very subtle disease. But when we see centrilobular lucencies, as we can appreciate here, involving uh, more than 0.5% and less than 5% of any zone, we call it mild. When these centrilobular lucencies involve greater than 5% of a zone, we call it moderate. When we see the centrilobular lucencies uh, becoming confluent, as we see here, then we call it confluent centrilobular emphysema. And then when there is a little more destruction, the confluence reaches a level where there seems to be an increase in the volume of the area involved, then we call it advanced destructive emphysema. We can have different grades in the same patient. So the severest form at any level defines the label that we are going to give the patient um, and say whether it's advanced destructive or confluent or moderate, etc. The same is true of paraseptal emphysema, where we have mild and uh, substantial, and this depends upon the thickness of the paraseptal cysts. Um, so if the uh, this thickness is less than a centimeter, then we call it mild. Here you can see that the thickness is greater than a centimeter, so it's a, a substantial. You can see that not only is the paraseptal, there's also confluent um, centrilobular emphysema. Though most of this seems moderate, you can see the areas of confluence in a couple of segments, and that's enough uh, to say that we have a combination of substantial and confluent centrilobular emphysema. So I can put all of this together in a single slide to get a better understanding of what mild, moderate, confluent, advanced, destructive centrilobular emphysema looks like, and then mild and substantial paraseptal emphysema. We can quantify, and there is a lot of research happening currently. We still are not aware of how this will pan out in the clinical realm. But this is one such situation. This patient has moderate centrilobular emphysema, and then one such software has shown us 43% air trapping and 3% fixed lucency. The eventual aim using any of these techniques to estimate the extent of emphysema and air trapping is to correlate with the gold stages so as to get more functional information from the CT scans and perhaps even identify specific phenotypes um, that can then have specific forms of treatment and management. So as the management evolves into more subcategorization and specific forms of treatment. So also will the role of CT scan imaging quantification evolve to serve those needs. Now, when we talk about smokers and COPD, we don't just get emphysema in isolation. And so the same patient, for example, here has confluent centrilobular and paraseptal emphysema also has these ill-defined centrilobular nodules of respiratory bronchiolitis, has those associated with traction bronchiectasis, so we say that there's RP with fibrosis, has reticular opacities, which we are labeling smoking-related interstitial fibrosis, in the lower lobes has airway expansion with fibrosis, and this combination of emphysema and AEF or interstitial lung disease could be labeled as combined pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema. And in fact, every patient who presents with emphysema, you can see advanced destructive emphysema here, uh, should be examined on CT for interstitial lung disease and vice versa. So here you have uh, a fibrosing ILD, which there is a little bit of airway expansion fibrosis. The rest is a smoking related interstitial fibrosis, and the combination is CPFE. And we also have more uh, guidelines that came out a year ago uh, that put this in better uh, perspective.
But let's look at um, never smokers as well. And so the same, though the same patterns described in smokers may occur in never smokers, never smokers often have different patterns. For example, this 46 year old lady with a long standing history of wheeze and mild breathlessness. And you can see this inspiratory expiratory pair. There is um, overinflation here. There's a lot of fibrosis posteriorly. You can see volume loss posteriorly in the posterior segments of the upper lobes and the superior segments of the lower lobes with more compensatory overinflation in the non-dependent segments. And there's extensive air trapping um, as part of the small airways disease, which my colleague uh, Kushbu is going to cover uh, in, a, in a subsequent lecture. On the coronal images, these are only inspiratory. We can see the extent of overinflation, diaphragmatic flattening, and the upper lobe fibrosis, which is post-infectious as, as well. So what this patient has are multiple findings. Post-infectious fibrosis due to old TB, areas of constrictive bronchiolitis and small airways disease, some showing tubular bronchiectasis and areas of overinflation. But clinically, the patient had COPD. So these are findings of COPD in never smokers. And we must remember that 50% of all COPD worldwide is due to non-tobacco causes. And the poorer the country, the more is the non-smoking component. Women share a higher burden than men. And these are the various causes of COPD in uh, never smokers. Now, why is this relevant for radiologists? I mean, for pulmonologists and physicians, these are obvious things. And, but for radiologists who read CT scans, we must remember that in countries like India, COPD is not uncommon in non-smokers. And when we are reading these scans, it is important to report the presence of air trapping and associated bronchial changes, including bronchiectasis in detail. And um, it is a good idea for physicians and pulmonologists, and if you're you know, listening to this lecture, to work with the radiologists and to um, make sure that they understand what is expected of them um, when when they're reading scans of uh, never smokers COPDs? And again, this is another patient. This is the same patient where we did quantification and found 44 percent air trapping and seven percent fixed hyperlucencies. But we still don't know what to do with this information. But hopefully, we'll have uh, more to go with in the future. We then move on to bronchiectasis, which is irreversible, localized, or diffuse uh, bronchial dilatation. Uh, from a radiology perspective, the questions to be answered are about the diagnosis, the etiology, and associated small airways. The small airways part, my colleague, will be covered. The signs are these, and I'll explain them in a little more detail. Bronchiectasis please understand is one of the simplest and easiest radiology di diagnoses to make on, on CT scans. Now, normally the bronchus is smaller than the accompanying artery, and you always see the bronchus and the artery hand in hand. Um, when the bronchus is larger than the artery, now whether you use the outer airway or the inner airway, it doesn't really matter. Nobody actually measures this in real life or in clinical practice. We just eyeball it. Uh, so when the bronchus is larger than the artery, we call it uh, bronchiectasis. And here's the signet ring when we see the bronchus and the artery separately aligned like this. Uh, when bronchi or bronchioles uh, divide. The daughter bronchioles are always smaller and they taper. When they don't, as we see here, then that means there's bronchiectasis or bronchiolectasis. Typically, we don't see bronchioles in the last uh, one to two centimeters of the lungs. If we do, then that again means there's bronchiectasis or bronchiolectasis. We also have additional signs and they are listed here. Wall thickening is again eyeballed. We don't measure it. Typically, the normal bronchi have very thin, just just perceptible walls. And the moment you see something that is more than perceptible, then that's wall thickening. 
Mucoid impaction is diagnosed when we see two white structures next to each other. So here, for example, you see the white artery and then another white structure, and that should immediately tell us that there's mucoid impaction in an adjacent dilated bronchus. And when we see tree and bud distally, that means there's associated inflammatory or infectious bronchiolitis. There are other forms of bronchiectasis, such as traction bronchiectasis, which is an important component of fibrosing interstitial lung disease, um, and parasecatricial bronchiectasis that typically occurs following infections like tuberculosis. And so if you want to put all of this together in a single slide, you have the primary signs at the top where you have the airway to artery ratio greater than one, and I, to repeat, it doesn't matter whether you use the outer or the inner, and no one actually measures in, in practice. Visibility of peripheral airways, lack of tapering, and then you have all of these secondary signs um, at the bottom. The next job that we have as radiologists is to find the etiology if possible. And here is the list of the common etiologies that we see in practice. Uh, Raja and his colleagues came out with this paper in 2019, just pre-COVID. And you can see that in India, uh, one third of all patients are post-tuberculous, and then you have uh, the rest of them here. But this is one patient where it's relatively easy to make the diagnosis because there's dextrocardia and mid and lower zone uh, bronchiectasis and inflammatory bronchiolitis. This is primary ciliary dyskinesia, and this patient has a subvariant which we know is called Cartagena's syndrome. The other condition that presents with asthma clinically and this kind of a radiology appearance where we have proximal central bronchiectasis is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. The pathognomonic sign is the presence of these high attenuation mucus plugs within the dilated bronchi. These can be focal to begin with, but if the disease is not under, kept under control and keeps progressing, then it would tell us that, um, and then you would see it to be bilateral um, and more extensive as we see in this patient. So on the radiograph itself, we can identify the gloved finger and the VY shaped opacities. And then in one segment, in the anterior segment of the upper lobe, we're seeing a large high attenuation mucus plug obstructing this bronchus with post-obstructive changes. This is a 60-year-old man with long-standing asthma, recurrent infections. You see the patient having significant bronchiectasis. But if you look at the trachea um, and the main bronchi, you see this diverticular formation. And this is typical of Munier Poon. Sometimes we can even make a diagnosis of other conditions, as in this patient with, uh, with mucoid expectoration, 15 years old, with cystic bronchiectasis, and then there's pancreatic atrophy and fat infiltration telling us that this patient has cystic uh, fibrosis. Small airways disease will be covered in much greater detail by Kushbu. I'd like to spend a, a minute on technique. All of these diagnoses that I've talked about, all of the findings that I have described are only possible when the CT scan images are of optimal quality. This is the scanning technique. We need volume supine inspiratory one millimeter or thinner slices at 0.5 millimeter intervals or better. Every patient needs to have an expiratory scan at the first instance and if we're dealing with interstitial lung diseases, then we also need a volume prone image. If there is no ILD, then we don't need a prone study. But it is important to have an inspiratory volume scan and then an expiratory scan. The inspiratory scan obtained at end inspiration in suspended respiration. And it is important that you work with your radiologist to make sure that this can be done. I have uh, done a series of 12 lectures uh, last uh, sometime in late uh, 2023 or yes uh, thank you thank you dr jankaria for this amazing talk it was so informative and the way you explained about imaging in copd and bronchiectasis 
I'm pretty sure it is going to help everyone in the audience and all of us listening a great, great, great deal. So now after uh, knowing about and hearing about imaging in large airway diseases, now we can delve into basically imaging and HRCT in small airway diseases. So this talk will be done by Dr. Khushbu Pilanya. So I will just introduce Dr. Khushbu Pilanya. So Dr. Khushbu Pilanya is a consultant radiologist and founder at Eisen Imaging and Intervention. She is the author of various textbooks and a chapter including radiology of bone tumors in textbooks of orthopedics, the locomotor system in textbooks of imaging and critical care medicine in encyclopedia of radiology, imaging of finger and hand, inflammatory myopathy, and many others. So she has over 40 national and international publications and poster presentations in national and international conferences as well. She has been invited as a faculty at multiple, more than 200 national and international conferences over the last 10 years. So Dr. Kushbu, I would like to invite you and share your views on imaging in small airway diseases and HRCT in small airway diseases. Over to you, Dr. Kushbu. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Hardik, for that. Uh, I think um, I am unable to share my screen. That's an issue. Just let me, for that kind, I, let, just let me check if, is my screen visible? Can you see the PowerPoint? No, ma'am. If you see, if you see on the right side, there'll be entire screen. If you just click on entire screen, you will have to just click on the box, which is there. Is this fine now? Yeah, we can see your screen. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you, ma'am. Over to so you. So thank you, Dr. Hardik, for that kind introduction. And uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be a part of this meeting. Thank you, Dr. Nene, for having me here and to talk about imaging in small airways disease. It's always a tough, tough task to speak on an HRCT after uh, Dr. Bhavan Jankarya. Let's see how uh, we go ahead with uh, what we have about small airways. So I have no disclaimers and uh, we talk about HRCT in small airways disease. Uh, it is about how to image which Dr. Bhavan Jankaria has beautifully explained and has stressed upon, but it can never be stressed on less. That imaging is as important as is interpretation. So we will go ahead about talking how to image and how to interpret. When we talk about the definition, so what is a small airways disease? Obviously, it is a disease involving the small airways. What are the small airways? These are the bronchioles. These are the part of the, the terminal part of the airways that do not have any cartilage or gland. They are by definition less than or equal to 2 millimeters. And if I talk about the radiology definition, we refer to them as that part of the airway, which if normal is not seen. So if you see these small airways, that means it is disease. That is how the HRCT definition of the small airways goes. So it is something in the peripheral one centimeter of the lung. And usually you do not see any airways there. Now, when you talk about how the various diseases involve the small airways, the small airways disease can be primarily a small airways problem. That is primarily a bronchiolar disease, which involves the constrictive bronchiolitis, the acute bronchiolitis, pan bronchiolitis, respiratory bronchiolitis, mineral airway disease, follicular bronchiolitis. So anywhere where the pathology starts within the bronchioles, it is the primary bronchiolar disease. However, the bronchioles can also be involved by a pathology arising from outside them. So when there is a lung parenchymal issue involving the bronchioles, or there is an interstitial issue involving the bronchioles or any other systemic issue involving the bronchioles, like we see with hypersensitivity pneumonitis, where there is primarily a hypersensitive reaction involving the interstitium and secondarily the bronchioles in the airways. 
the rbi ild wherein the interstitial involvement has also occurred the cryptogenic organizing in pneumonia wherein the lung parenchymal affliction is there leading to secondarily involvement of the bronchioles and then other interstitial lung disease as well like sarcoidosis uh, langerhans cell histiocytosis so now this is basically a etiological diagnosis it does not have much uh, relevance with respect to when we talk about the hrct patterns the hrct patterns or what you see on hrct in a patient where the suspicion is of a small airways disease depends upon not what is causing the affection of the bronchioles but how is the pathology of the bronchioles happening so the bronchioles can be involved in two patterns number one either there is an obstruction of the bronchioles or there is inflammation of the bronchioles so whatever be the underlying etiology it leads to some specific pattern of insults on the bronchioles depending upon the pattern of insult of, on the bronchioles we see various imaging findings so if the uh, external etiology has caused obstruction of bronchioles then we talk about the nature of obstruction the obstruction can be due to some intraluminal plugs polyps as happens in cases where the surrounding lung parenchyma is primarily involved there is a consolidation in the lung which leads to formation of intraluminal polyps or uh, plugs within the bronchioles and we get a pattern which we call the organizing pneumonia pattern the same pattern in the earlier days was called the boop the bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia pattern the second way of affection of bronchioles in which the bronchioles are obstructed is the constrictive bronchiolitis wherein you have irreversible circumferential fibrosis as a result of some direct insult to the bronchioles as occurs in cases of sequel of prior viral infections etc when you have such constriction of the bronchioles it leads to regional air trapping and reduced perfusion because in a segment of the lung the air is not being ventilated properly because the bronchioles are diseased and constricted and it leads to what we call the mosaic attenuation the differential shades of the lung one of the uh, most important features of small airways diseases then we talk about the inflammation of the bronchioles wherein it's not that the bronchioles are obliterated the bronchioles are patent but they are inflamed so when they are inflamed it will lead to thickening of the surrounding walls and it will also lead to some intraluminal secretions and how do we see them on a ct scan so you start seeing the bronchioles the bronchioles which as far we've been discussing if normal are not seen but then when their walls get thickened because of inflammation they start being seen on the hrct and then the other thing that you see with these cases is the centrilobular nodules the tree in bud pattern wherein the terminal bronchioles or the terminal airways are plugged with the mucus so this is the predominant pathology and the corresponding expected findings on the hrct which we will be discussing so primarily these are the three patterns that you see on hrct in a patient with small airways so you see an organizing pneumonia pattern wherein there is obstruction of the bronchioles due to some plugs which arise more mostly due to some consolidation or lung parenchymal changes surrounding it then you have the regional air trapping or reduced perfusion in cases of constrictive bronchiolitis leading to a mosaic attenuation and then you have the thickened airways or the centrilobular nodules which occur in the cases of acute inflammatory bronchiolitis when the the predominant pathology is inflammation uh -huh. the mosaic attenuation or regional air trapping is one of the most confusing uh, patterns in small airways because to be able to elicit it number 1 is difficult number 2 to be able to pick it and differentiate whether this is normal or abnormal is again difficult then to differentiate the various causes of mosaic attenuation is difficult so for these reason it holds one of the you know um, um, kind of uh, star uh, questions when you are talking about 
small airways disease. So first we'll talk about this. We said that mosaic attenuation is one of the important patterns in which an HRC, uh, important patterns on HRCT for small airways disease. So when we talk of mosaic attenuation, we also need to know what is a normal lung attenuation. So normal lung attenuation, we mean that what is the shade of the lung of a normal lung on HRCT? There are various components which define the shade of the lung. What are these components? In the lung parenchyma, you have air, you have blood and you have lung tissue. There are only three components. So all these three components together define the lung attenuation. A normal lung is a homogeneous black attenuation because the predominant component is air. And however, the attenuation of the lung depends also on the acquisition phase. So whether the acquisition is an inspiration or it is an expiration. The shade of the lung will change. Why? Because obviously the three components are air, blood and lung tissue. Between inspiration and expiration, the quantum of air within the lung tissue changes. So the lung becomes more denser when the air is expelled out during expiration. Again, I cannot less reinforce this that to be able to elicit all of this, an adequate HRCT technique is a mandate, mandate must. This has already been reinforced by Dr. Bhavan Jankaria and we need to know that without this, none of the interpretation makes sense. So a good volume inspiratory scan followed by a volume expiratory scan is a mandate must in cases where airways disease is a question. Now we were talking about a normal lung attenuation. So this is a picture which we need to remember of a normal lung attenuation. A normal lung looks like this. The shade of the lung parenchyma is similar or just slightly more than the shade, black shade within the trachea. So this is how a normal lung should look like. It should be homogeneously black. This is how a lung looks like in inspiration. However, when we talk about expiration, the shade of the lung becomes more gray because as we said, the air is expelled out. So in these cases, the shade will be grayer than that of the trachea and this should not be misinterpreted as ground glass. Apart from that, we see a gravity dependent gradient. So black, white, 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 more white. So when you see such a homogeneous gradation, Again, you know, it is not an abnormal ground glass, but it's the normal expiratory scan. And because of expiration, this gradient, this gradient is seen. So we should be able to differentiate an, a lung which has been acquired in inspiration from a scan which has been acquired in expiration because a lot of our interpretation depends on this. How do we differentiate? Very simple. In inspiration, the trachea is round. In expiration, the trachea becomes flattened from the back. So the first and foremost thing, when you start seeing a CT scan, look at the trachea. Try to figure out that whether you are looking at an inspiratory or an expiratory scan. So let us look at these four examples and try to define for ourselves which is normal. So this is all black lung. The first thing I see that the trachea is round, so it's an inspiratory scan, lung is black, homogeneous, paralleling with that of the trachea, it is normal. It is a more grey lung, I am tempted to call it ground glass, but then I look at the trachea, it is flattened from the back and I know it's an expiratory scan and at the same time I see a gradation. So this is again a normal expiratory scan. In this case, I see a lung which is slightly more grayer in the trachea. Then I look at the trachea and I realize it's a good inspiratory scan. So this lung is abnormal. Similarly, in this case, it is there is no homogeneity, a lot of heterogeneity and we know the lung is abnormal. So which of these is normal? Only A, A, B or A, B, C. And we realize that only A and B are normal. Why? This is an inspiratory scan. This is an expiratory scan where this ground glass is expected. Now we come to the topic mosaic attenuation. What is mosaic attenuation? Heterogeneity in the lung parenchyma, irrespective of whether it's in the inspiratory or the expiratory phases. If you see such heterogeneity, you know it is mosaic attenuation. That's a terminology with respect to CT scan. So 
the lung has mosaic attenuation it does not define the underlying pathology we have to figure out what is the cause of mosaic attenuation there can be multiple causes of mosaic attenuation because we realize that air is only one component of lung attenuation so disease of air can cause mosaic attenuation disease of blood can cause mosaic attenuation disease of the lung interstitium can cause mosaic attenuation so when there is differential air retention on expiratory scan it causes air trapping small airways diseases and mosaic attenuation when there is differential blood supply to different parts of the lung again it will lead to mosaic attenuation due to mosaic perfusion this occurs in cases of pulmonary thromboembolism and also in long standing small airways disease then differential infiltration of the lung tissue as occurs with interstitial lung diseases so let's look at these two scans you have a good inspiratory scan and then you think that it is all normal so it's homogeneous lung you don't see a pathology the patient has come with some mild uh, persistent uh, uh, cough which was not being treated and you see the ct scan and you say it's normal but when you do the expiratory scan you see a lot of mosaic attenuation all over and you realize it is not normal this patient has a small airways disease which is elicited so well on the expiratory scan similarly you have mosaic attenuation on the inspiratory scan on the expiratory scan now is this small airways disease so that is what i was coming to it is not just airways in this case the cause is pulmonary thromboembolism it is due to differential perfusion again inspiratory expiratory the mosaicism is more accentuated but it was present on inspiratory also in the inspiratory there is a lot of ground glass so we realize that there is some component of lung infiltration apart from the airways and it is an interstitial lung disease the way we see with hypersensitivity pneumonitis so how do we differentiate between these causes of mosaic attenuation if we follow a simple algorithm life becomes much simple so i see an hrct and i see mosaic attenuation it is easy to uh, pick up mosaic attenuation simple when you see a heterogeneous lung parenchyma it is mosaic attenuation the first question you should ask yourself is whether it's an inspiratory or an expiratory scan so you look at the scan and you realize the trachea is flattened it's an expiratory scan we go back and look at the inspiratory scan if the inspiratory scan was normal that means it's an airways disease so for example this was an expiratory scan with mosaic attenuation the inspiratory scan is absolutely normal and we know it's an airways disease that is there is differential air trapping now if you look at the expiratory if you see that the mosaic attenuation was on the expiratory scan but on the inspiratory the mosaicism persists unlike the previous case where on the inspiratory it was normal so if the mosaicism is seen on expiratory and it persisted on the inspiratory the next thing you do is look at the caliber of the vessels in the black and the whiter areas if the vessel caliber in both areas is normal that means it's not due to differential perfusion it means it is due to differential infiltration as you see with hypersensitivity pneumonitis so expiratory scan air trapping inspiratory scan again air trapping is persisting so we rule out airways only airways component we see that the vessel caliber is almost more or less similar in the black areas and in the whiter areas and so we know there is no differential perfusion and it is an infiltrative lung disease the third case scenario is when the caliber of vessels is differential so you have black areas with smaller vessels and white areas with larger vessels and on the expiratory images there was air trapping which remained more or less similar or improved then it is a chronic pulmonary thromboembolism if in a patient with differential blood vessel caliber on the expiratory images the air trapping increases then we call it due to airways component we'll come to it so let us look at this case mosaic attenuation an expiratory scan inspiratory scan more or less similar the whiter areas have larger blood vessels blacker areas have smaller blood blood vessels that means the differential attenuation is due to differential perfusion and it's a case of chronic pulmonary thromboembolism the fourth case scenario wherein 
the differential perfusion and airways component are together. So, for example, in this inspiratory scan, we are seeing some areas of air trapping which have accentuated. And in the blacker areas, we also see that the blood vessel is normal in caliber, uh, is lesser in caliber. So, airways disease is also associated with hyperperfusion. But the way we differentiate is, you know, uh, trying to relate to the fact that the air trapping accentuates on expiration. If it is accentuating, that means there is definitely an airways component. If air trapping remains, uh, the mosaicism remains same between inspiration and expiration, that means it's predominantly a vascular component. So this is again the same example wherein it's an inspiratory scan and you see that the uh, between the black and the white areas, the vessel caliber is same. Here, the vessel caliber is more in the white areas, lesser in the black areas. Again, much more in the white areas and lesser in the blacker areas. This was on the inspiratory scan. So, this is definitely due to abnormal lung. These two are due to abnormal perfusions. Now, we do the expiratory scan and we realize that the air trapping ex increases much more in this case. So, that means the reduced vessel was also due to air trapping. Whereas in this case, the air trapping remains more or less the same. So, this was due to pulmonary thromboembolism. So, the first case was hypersensitivity pneumonitis, constrictive bronchiolitis and pulmonary thromboembolism. So, this is the basic algorithm that you may use to try and differentiate the various causes of mosaic attenuation to pick up the causes which are due to small airways and rule out causes of mosaic attenuation which are not due to the small airways disease. Mosaic attenuation in context of small airways disease occurs when the small airways involvement is of the form of constrictive bronchiolitis. Constrictive bronchiolitis occurs when there is an insult to the bronchioles leading to irreversible fibrosis, which occurs in cases like post-inflammatory or infectious bronchiolitis, post-toxic fume exposure, some connective tissue diseases, post-transplant due to some drugs and also secondary to large airways involvement. So again, coming back to the where these small airways are involved, it can be a constrictive bronchiolitis, which is an obstructive airways disease, which presents with mosaic attenuation. It can be an obstructive small airways involvement due to intrabronchiolar plugs, which leads to an organizing pneumonia pattern, or it can be a proliferative or inflammatory bronchiolitis where there is primary inflammation of the bronchial walls and not so much of obliteration and so the bronchial walls start being seen. This is a very typical organizing pneumonia pattern wherein you see patches of consolidation surrounding the bronchioles. Then you have the pattern wherein you start seeing the smaller airways. So as we already discussed that airways towards the peripheral one centimeter are usually not seen. When you start seeing these airways in the peripheral one centimeter, then you know they are diseased. So in this case, when you're seeing these airways towards the ends, these small dots, that means the air, smaller airways are involved. So that is when you start seeing the airways due to direct involvement, then you talk about the proliferative bronchiolitis, which typically occurs like these tree and bud nodules. So these are the terminal bronchioles or the terminal airways, which are plugged with mucus or they are very much inflamed that they appear as these typical tree and bud pattern, which is very typical of an inflammatory or infective bronchiolitis. So this is pan bronchiolitis, wherein all the bro uh, bronchioles throughout the lung are involved. And another is the pattern where you, you see these ill-defined centrilobular nodules. Then you have the follicular bronchiolitis, respiratory bronchiolitis. All of them have a very similar pattern. So as I said towards the beginning, multiple etiologies lead to certain very specific pattern of involvement in the lung parenchyma in cases of small airways disease. Then sometimes the inflammation is not so much within the bronchioles, but from outside the bronchioles as occurs in cases of acute hypersensitivity pneumonitis leading to such ill-defined centrilobular nodules. One of the tricks to enhance the visualization of these tree and bud nodules, centrilobular nodules, is to use a 3, three to 5 mm MIP images on the lung window. 
So this is again stressing on the fact that ask for the soft copy images. So this cannot be done unless you have the soft copy data sets. So once you have them, do these three to five mm MIP and these nodules will be seen very, very well. So just before winding up, one of the most important things is that both end inspiratory and end expiratory scans are a mandate must to be able to diagnose small airways disease. The acquisition should be an HRCT acquisition, ask for soft copy images, flattened trachea means expiratory image. The three main patterns of CT in a small airways disease is mosaic attenuation. We need to differentiate the cause of mosaic attenuation. Mosaic attenuation is heterogeneous geniality in the lung parenchyma, which can be due to heterogeneity in the air, heterogeneity in the vascular supply or heterogeneity in the lung infiltration. We've discussed at length on how to differentiate one from other. When you look at tree and bud nodules, it means that you're looking at a proliferative bronchiolitis or you may have an organizing pneumonia pattern. So that is all from my end. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kushbu, for this amazing uh, talk. So now, basically, uh, we understood about uh, imaging in large airway diseases, which was followed by small airway diseases from the radiologist's perspective. And basically, in every patient that we treat, the most important thing is an MDT, a multidisciplinary team. That is what I feel. So along with the radiologist, who better than one of the most renowned pulmonologist in India, which is Dr. Amita Nene and Dr. Nitin Abhyankar. So now we will get the pulmonologist perspective in imaging in airway diseases. So I will just invite Dr. Amita Nene to just uh, speak and have a few words and also introduce Dr. Nitin Abhyankar. Over to you, Dr. Nene. Thank you, Dr. Hardik, for uh, handing this over to me. And first of all, I would really want to congratulate Dr. Kushbu for the fantastic talk. I think, Kushbu, you were really very, very good. It was a brilliant talk covering everything that we wanted to hear. And of course, the talk by Dr. Bhavan Shankarya was also excellent. Uh, I would want to thank Dr. Hardik and Team GSK for this wonderful initiative, you know, the academic initiative. You know, this is something that we really want to learn. We pulmonologists really want to read our HRCT chest better. And uh, of course, a wonderful initiative by Indian Chest Society, our president, Dr. Sandeep Salvi and Dr. Rajadhara secretary for making sure that we are taking academics to the doorstep of every pulmonologist in the country. So with this brief introduction, I'd like to now invite my very dear friend, Dr. Nitin Abhyamkar, who doesn't require any kind of introduction whatsoever. He's a brilliant pulmonologist. He's an excellent academician and he is one of the best interventional pulmonologists we have in the country. He is practicing, he's doing IP since 20 years and he's a course coordinator for respiratory therapy Pune Hospital Regional Chest uh, Center and he's the vice president of Indian Association of Bronchology and uh, founder director of school interventional pulmonology, just so many very things. But the bottom line is that Dr. Nitin Abhyankar is pride of our Maharashtra. With this small introduction, I'd like to introduce and welcome my dear friend, Dr. Nitin Abhyankar. Over to you, Nitin. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, I, I guess I was lost for a minute or so. So, where are we? We can start with this presentation. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah excellent. Uh, see, I think Kushbu and Bhavin are one of the best uh, CT radiologists in this country. And uh, I think they have done a great job of uh, confusing our past clinicians. No end. Let me tell you very frankly. So I think uh, I'm, I'm trying to simplify 
it as as best as I can, and then Amita and uh, she'll she'll be coming with her question. So so whatever messages they were trying to give us, a few of the take homes are a COPD is essentially characterized by a progressive. Uh, can I can I get my uh, slide set back? Yeah, that's that's great. Can 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 we go full screen if possible? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. The COPD is essentially characterized by a progressive worsening in the lung function because of the irreversible airway obstruction. This is either caused by a loss of the alveolar gas section units or and the elasticity and or the mucofibrotic remodeling. So multiple uh, interplays of these three things which will happen. CT imaging using advanced X-rays and computers is possibly crucial in identifying and also phenotyping, if you want to use that word, or characterizing the large airway diseases. Firstly, confirming the COPD and then also indicating some kind of disease progression with the kind of tools that you have at your disposal. Uh, I don't think Bhavin or Kushbu have really referred to MRI as yet, but MRI in addition allows safe longitudinal imaging. That means you could do collect more data while obviating the risks associated with ionizing radiation. So possibly MRI is the future tool. And I think we'll have their thought processes on this while we are at the discussion table. Chess radiography, I mean, that's what we have been doing for last so many decades. And most of the uh, most parts of the country can only afford that at this point in time and a quality chest radiography. Where will it really play a role? It will mainly play a role in, say, picking up a pneumothorax, kind of a complication, and rule out conditions which are mimicking symptoms of asthma. Spirometry, when we look at spirometry at, as of now, remains as an insensitive tool for early small airway changes. Of course, we have a disruptive technology like uh, at this point in time, what we have is impulse oscillometry or airway oscillometry, and which has been changing the gameplay substantially. But at the same time, at this point in time, what we have with us is a better quality, better resolution HRCTs and relatively less accessibility to IOS or impulse airway oscillometry. To be more broader in the term because force oscillometry does exist. So, with substantial disease uh, presents before abnormal observations can be seen. So, the whole idea is if I have to really pick up a COPD on a spirometry, it will take me probably a decade by the time the smoker has smoked for 10 more years. And that might be the best message that, that can be there. So, why do I want to diagnose it very early? Whether it is a disruptive technology like impulse oscillometry, or whether it is a or whether it is a standardized and improving technology like CT or maybe even MRI eventually, and I will will have our radiologist talking about it. But the abnormality can be seen earlier if we use a more sensitive tool, and therefore I think spirometry cannot be the gold standard in the early disease at least. Of course, established disease, it still remains the gold standard. That's not a problem. Next slide, please. Can we have the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you. So, once again, let me reiterate that chest X-ray is considered valuable in the initial evaluation of patients with a suspected small airway disease it can reveal signs of air trapping. However, the chest X-ray findings are often fairly non-specific and may require further eva evaluation with advanced imaging modalities. And of course, we have spent a lot of time on HRCT. We might spend a little more time on the MRI in the discussion part of it, but HRCT is the imaging modality of choice for evaluating the small airway diseases, offering a very detailed visualization of the bronchial walls bronchioles, and the surrounding lung parenchyma. Although less commonly used than CT, MRI can, can technically provide additional information in certain cases, particularly in pediatric patients or in individuals with 
who are having a contraindication for using an HRCT or a, or a CT imaging. So with that, I think I will hand it over to Dr. Amita and uh, thank you very much for your patient listening. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Nathan. It was a very, very precise and very concise to the point presentation. Thank you so much. I'd like to now invite Dr. Kushbu also uh, to uh, join. Uh, Dr. Kushbu, can you please uh, switch on your video? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, great. So we've had two fantastic talks by Dr. Kushbu and Dr. Nathan, and I'm very, very happy to now ask questions which we for now just keep on facing. We have many, many questions from the audience also. So some of the questions I'll ask, which I feel are important, and then we'll go to audience questions. So I'll ask, come to Dr. Kushbu first. So Dr. Kushbu, can you tell me that how would HRCD chest help in differentiating us between various COPD phenotypes like emphysema, chronic bronchitis, etc. from the HRCD? Can you make out? Uh, definitely, we can. So when we try to differentiate the emphysema predominant versus airways predominant versus a mixed type, it is quite easy if the HRCT has been acquired properly because the centrilobular emphysema, the panlobular emphysema, the paraseptal emphysema, they are evident as these cystic airways, uh, airspace dilations versus the chronic bronchitis, in which case we more often see the air trapping, which we have we've discussed. So, if we, if we have acquired the inspiratory expiratory sets and we see predominant air trapping, then we know we are dealing with an airways predominant COPD, wherein if we are seeing a lot of centrilobular emphysema, which will be evident on the inspiratory scans itself, then we know we are dealing with an em, uh, emphysema predominant COPD. Okay, fine. And about chronic bronchitis? So for chronic bronchitis, most of the times the pattern that you see on a CT scan is the mosaicism or the air trapping. So if you do the inspiratory expiratory set and you see significant air trapping, then you know you are dealing with chronic bronchitis. When it is with respect to the smaller airways, when you are talking about the larger airways, then the various signs like the tram tax signs, the signet ring signs, wherein the larger bronchioles are visible, will be visible to us. Okay, I thought maybe basically I thought maybe chronic bronchitis we might get peribronchial thickening. We That's it. So the bronchus the bronchus becomes visible only when you see the peribronchial thickening. Otherwise, the bronchial walls are so thin that you do not see them on an HRCT. When the walls become thick, they are visible. And that's when we start calling them bronchic tasses. And the chronic bronchitis has both elements. Either you see the bronchi for themselves or you see the air trapping secondary to their involvement by constrictive bronchiolitis. Wonderful. So I believe so this way emphysema is very, very easy to pick up on HRCT. And if it's chronic bronchitis and requirement of expiratory scans, Yes, thank you. Yeah. I'd like to come to Dr. Nitin now. So Nitin, you did cover a part of it, but again, I want to ask that, uh, can you elaborate on the current methods for diagnosing COPD and the limitations of these methods? Yeah, I think we have been using for COPD, very frankly, ordinary chest X-ray for most of the times. So we do not really resort to a CT, but I think increasingly over the last decade or so, we are asking for a CT radiology also. I think the MRI is possibly in the future, and I think one of the radiologists can eventually elaborate on it. Uh, we have been using gold standard as uh, spirometry. We are essentially looking at uh, FE1, FE, FEC ratio, which does not go beyond 0.7, and uh, post bronchodilator reading remains more or less the same. There is no reversibility, or there is a partial reversibility at the best. And once in a while, of course, we have uh, asthmosiopathy overlap, that is echo, but that's a rarity. So, what we really look for diagno for the diagnosis. Uh, COPD as a gold standard is a combination of chest X-ray. Combine that with a combine that with a spirometry, which shows me a fixed obstruction, plus minus a restriction and a partial reversibility at the best. But if you really ask me, in the last five or six years, the clinicians are seeing a C change in the terms of impulse oscillometry or airway oscillometry, if you want to call it that. And that has been changing the game dramatically, just as much as the HRCT has happened 
over the last decade and MRI may happen over the next decade. That's what I, 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 I can summarize that. Yeah, wonderfully said. So I basically feel that clinical history is most important. So basically, a patient who's usually more than forty years of age and is either a smoker or there is exposed the to some kind of yes, or is exposed to something noxious, of course. I mean, it has to be anything that, that is a trigger. You know, nauseous chemicals. We know biomass, etc. This over and above with history of uh, breathlessness, which is progressive, and cough, expectoration, etc. Over and above PFT and IOS would. We probably very, very useful in probably diagnosing those COPD zero, as we say, you know, in which the spirometry might be normal, but IOS might come abnormal, like we are seeing in HRCT where we see uh, expiratory scans, uh, expiratory air trapping. Uh, so thank you, Nitin, for this answer. Great. I'd like to come to Dr. Uh, Kushbu now. So Dr. Kushbu, like based on the CT scan of a COPD patient, can you tell us if this is severe or not? Can you assess severity? based on HRCT chest. So, uh, as was discussed by Dr. Bhavan Jankarya also, it's mild, moderate, severe. We can uh, rate them on that basis, basis the extent of percentage of the lung involvement. That's what we can do on an HRCT. We can definitely tell the extent of lung parenchymal involvement. So, basic 5%, 10%, 20%, that is possible. But at the end of the day, the severity will be basis the clinical presentation. Um, so, I mean, it, it can add as a supplement to the clinical presentation of the patient, wherein if clinically the patient has very severe disease, we can add on to it by saying that, yes, the HRCT is also showing severe changes. Wonderful. So, I really like what you said, you know, that of course, we come to know about parenchymal damage, but we also know about PFT. We know the gold standard, mild, moderate, severe, very severe, but PFT is always to be uh, correlated clinical radiologically. So the radiologically extra information would help that, you know, FVC is probably low, not only because of air trapping, but also because of coexisting restriction, which might just be missed on our chest X-ray if it's involving the left lower lobe. So great. So now the same question for pulmonologists and radiologists both. I'll ask Dr. Kushbu first, then Nitin, I'll come to you. The same question. So basically looking at the HRCT, can we ever predict that this patient has a high chance of getting an acute exacerbation of COPD? Uh, not really. I mean, there aren't any um, such very specific telltale signs that uh, will tell us we can, yes, yes, definitely tell that this patient has a severe disease. But to say that this is a patient who is heralding a, a, an acute exacerbation on an HRCT star. Okay, wonderful. Nitin, what would you like to say? Absolutely agree with the Kushbu on this, uh, you know. We are completely at a loss of predicting who is going to be in the hospital day after tomorrow or even maybe to early morning tomorrow, despite having severe, very severe, you know, all the crack categories in place, perfectly sorted out CT, perfectly sorted out lung functions. And we really don't know whether he's harboring that pseudomonas or not, whether he's going to exacerbate because of that or not irrespective of whether he's harboring it or not. So I think the whole story remains unpredictable. And therefore, I think that phenotype of frequent exacerbators is not classified either by radiology or by lung. It is classified by the frequent exacerbations only. Correct. Absolutely. So if at all we do HRCT and if we are lucky, if patient has a pneumonia which is coming up or there's a small pneumothorax, you know, something like that, then we might come to know that this could lead to any kind of exacerbation, but otherwise just looking at the CT scan, we can't really decide about who could be the acute exacerbation types. Um, great. So I'd like to ask you, Dr. Kishbu, that looking, I'm asking you all the questions which we pulmonologists might feel. That, you know, for example, we have ACOS, which is, you know, basically it's asthma COPD overlap syndrome. And the thing is that it's mainly a clinical diagnosis, but by any chance looking at the CT scan, can you tell us, looking at the HRCT, that this could be combination of asthma with COPD? No. Can't. Right. Perfect. Agreed. Uh, so, Nathan, I want to come to you and ask you that uh, basically for asthma diagnosis, would you rely on CT scan or you'll go mainly by history, etc.? What do you do? I, I, I would look for history. In addition, for asthma, I, I must look for reversibility because that's how we define asthma and that's how we differentiate asthma from COPD. But a single reading may not be enough. 
because if somebody who's been badly managed for a long time, for say, for example, an asthmatic who's been totally badly treated, no inhaled corticosteroids for a good 10, 15 years, and the first lung function also may show me a very bad lung function with poor reversibility. But if I treat him with proper therapy, and another three months down the line, the whole story may change dramatically. Even for that same patient, the radiology may be dramatically abnormal to start with, but may normalize over a period of time. So I think the clinical story matters, the follow-up matters, and the trending of whatever you are doing eventually will matter. Most. Absolutely. Very, very well said. I completely agree. I think now from COPD, let's just move a little bit to bronchiectasis. So, uh, uh, Dr. Kushu, coming to you, we very well know that bronchiectasis is like most sensitively picked up on HRCT chest. And uh, already Dr. Bhavin spoke about, you know, all the wonderful signs that we have to diagnose bronchiectasis. So, I want to, uh, I would request you to just uh, enumerate these once again. Uh, what on HRCT will help us diagnose bronchiectasis? And then please tell us if there's new technology in HRCT or any new things which over and above might help us to diagnose bronchiectasis even earlier than now. So, uh, talking about the various uh, signs which help us diagnose bronchiectasis, the first thing is when we look at the bronchial artery, uh, uh, sorry, the uh, bron uh, bronchus and the adjoining pulmonary artery ratio, the ratio should be more than one. So, when the bronchi are bigger than the arteries, that means there is bronchiectasis. Usually the bronchial diameter is same as that of the artery. That is one. When you start seeing the bronchial walls as very prominent, that means there is some chronic or acute inflammation in the bronchial walls, which has thickened them and you are seeing it. So that becomes bronchiectasis. The signet ring sign is in cross section when you see a large uh, ring of the bronchus with a diamond of the artery studding on top of it that's a signet ring sign the tram track is when you see the bronchus going parallel to each other usually the normal anatomy is that the bronchus tapers that from larger to smaller smaller diameter but when they are diseased their ability to collapse becomes limited and you see two parallel moving tracks moving towards the periphery when you start seeing these bronchus in the peripheral one centimeter of the lung, again, it depicts that the bronchi are diseased and you are looking at bronchiolitis. So these are the various signs of bronchiolitis and bronchiectasis that you see. When you talk about if there is any advancement, the, may, the, the most phenomenal advancement over the last 10 years is the understanding of the fact how to acquire an HRCT. So everything has remained same, but the understanding of how to acquire HRCT has phenomenally changed. And that learning curve is the biggest advancement. Apart from that, yes, a lot of AI work is being done in trying to trace the bronchi towards the periphery. As yet, nothing has been FDA approved yet, that they will help us pick up things before anything else. So they are all in the pipeline. So let's hope that something comes up to pick up uh, these uh, findings better than, than before. Wonderful. You know, I just feel I like the way you said that, you know, how to do HRCT correctly is the best advancement we've had in recent times. And I'm just so happy that, you know, uh, Dr. Kushbu and Dr. Bhavan make it a point to, you know, stress upon this in every uh, meeting, whether it's radiology or pulmonology. So that's great. Uh, I would just like to add two more things about bronchiectasis that we were taught always, you know, for diagnosis. Uh, of course, we know about the ratio, but basically the thing is that if we see bronchi, which are non-tapering, so non-tapering of bronchi is also diagnostic of bronchiectasis. And if you see bronchi in the lateral one third pulmonary fields, you're not supposed to see them. But if you end up seeing bronchi in the lateral one third lung fields, if you divide them into medial, central and lateral. So if you see them, that also is suggestive of rather diagnostic of bronchiectasis. So we need to remember these three things, the ratio, the non tapering of bronchi and seeing the bronchi in the lateral one third of the lung fields. And of course, then we have the signet ring sign, etc. So, uh, there's an interesting question from the audience, Nitin. I'd like to ask you there's Dr. Sanali from Lucknow. She's asking that you're suspecting bronchiectasis from history. Uh, is there any particular reason when you might choose not to do a CT scan to confirm this? Um, I, I, unless until I mean, somebody is not able to perform a CT at all for, for whatever reason. I, I really don't see that. Very very often, 
I I I wonder going to MRI myself and I know how scary that damn thing was. But but at the same time, I think it just really takes a few seconds, unless until you just don't fit into the CT whatever that console is, uh, you are that huge. I really so see no contraindication for doing that. Uh, or I don't think a contrast is a must in this kind of a scenario. So it's a good inspiratory, good expiratory, and in some position situations, a prone positioning. So I think prone versus supine. So I I I I would rather not look at a CT as some kind of a menacing technique, which I will avoid. Mostly no, mostly no. Very very few. Uh, so Nitin, actually, I completely agree with you. I think I understand the question. Probably what uh, she means is that if the history is very typical, you're seeing clubbing and the chest X-ray is already showing bronchiectasis, then probably you may not need to do. So I agree. No, but, but all, all said and done, you, you, Amita, in yes. that case also, if the patient is not affording, that's a different story. But if the patient exactly. can afford it or it can be done, I would love to know what is the extent, what kind of pattern, is it cystic more, is it cylindrical more, what is dominant pattern, Is it oh, there are, are there some sub secretions, all that information is so invaluable. So, yeah, and I I'll, so... I'll, 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 and I'll, I'll, if I, I'm sorry, I'm taking the next half a minute, but I'll try and add in culture identification of what is residing in that uh, bronchi, those dilated bronchi, and is that going to be a, you know, a, a damaging future for that patient? So, I think that and is worth knowing whether chronic bronchial it, infection is there. No, okay. So, no, no, I totally agree with Dr. Nitin. So, the thing is that even if the patient's history and chest takes are obvious bronchial cases, doing an HRCT will always add more information because we know x ray is one dimensional and left lower lobe is not well seen. So, it's always good to know the extent of bronchial cases in case if the patient has massive hemoptysis, etc. You know what you're really dealing with. So, uh, I agree with Dr. Uh, uh, Nitin. And I think it was an interesting question, but in today's day and age, unless the patient is completely non affording or is so obese that can't go into the CT console, like Dr. Nitin said, we should always get the HRCT done. Because sometimes HRCD might even tell us about the cause of bronchiectasis, which we are not coming to know from the history. So with this, I'd like to ask Dr. Kushbu the same question, that when you diagnose bronchiectasis from HRCT, uh, do you think there are certain pointers which might contribute towards identifying the cause of bronchiectasis in this patient? Yes, uh, quite many times we have certain specific uh, signs, like for example, one of the um, uh, entities is the Meniere Keynes disease, where you start seeing these bronchial diverticula, and then you know that yes, that is the underlying cause. Uh, then you have ABPA, wherein if you see the high attenuation mucus sign, you know that the bronchiectasis and there is associated high attenuation mucus. Often, uh, if you see that there is something obliterating proximally, and you see the fluid uh, bronchogram sign within that is also helpful so quite there are quite many cases where in we can uh, at least give a suspicion of the underlying etiology if it's an active bronchiectasis versus it's a bronchiectasis which is a sequel of some prior insult it's a traction bronchiectasis versus it's a inflammatory bronchiectasis so those kind of details can be given on a ct scan yeah, wonderfully said. Uh, Nitin, would you like to add anything more? Yeah, I think more or less, yes. Very, very rarely, uh, since she was referring to constrictive obliterative bronchitis, and we have one of them. We have a diffuse pan bronchitis, we have one of them. But they have been identified only after a thoracosopic lung biopsy was done. Very, very rarely we will need them. But most of the time, the clinical story and a very high quality radiological imaging plus in addition, whenever cultures, when they are relevant, I think these three are good enough. So. Yeah, wonderful. So, uh, now coming to Dr. Kushbu, uh, you think there are any HRCD features which will help you differentiate between bronchiolitis and lower respiratory tract infection, not pneumonia, LRTI stroke bronchiolitis. Can you tell from HRCD? Oh. Uh i don't think uh, that is that will be more of a clinical call because uh, to a radiologist a lower respiratory tract infection can be seen as a bronchiolitis so if it's an infective bronchiolitis you are seeing central lobular nodules towards the terminal bronchus i cannot say for sure it is due to infection or due to inflammation if i don't have the clinical picture 
So if I'm told that this patient is febrile and everything, uh, then I know it's infection. If I know it's a smoker, then I would attribute it to uh, uh, bronchiolitis related to smoking. Yeah, wonderful. So basically, I think again, a view history becomes very, very important. So great. Uh, uh, coming to Dr. Nitin, there's a nice question from Dr. Sakshi uh, Batra. You know, she's a dear friend, uh, pulmonologist, a very, very competent, great pulmonologist. So I think I'd like to ask this question to both. So Nitin, I'll ask you first. Dr. Sakshi is asking that uh, that uh, she wants to know if sometimes it becomes difficult to differentiate between an upper lobe, a pical segment, big cavity, or a bulla when we see a post TB sequelae patient who's also a smoker, in this case, how would you differentiate between the bulla and the cavity? Very, very frankly, unless until, of course, I mean, uh, Kushbu will add something to what I'm saying, but unless until I have a thick wall, you know, something which is hinting me towards a cavity and which is eventually have as thick walls, that is one one way of differentiating but once in a while you will have really get you can really get stumped and particularly if some one of those cavities has ruptured and then eventually has been absorbed and then a thinner wall remains it's sometimes really really impossible to sort these two out. but i i think uh, pushbook can add something yes uh, not uh, really i i uh, i am also bold out with that but yes the same thing that if you have a thick wall the cavities are usually thick walled you have a thick walled cavity you have other stigmata of tb around or an infection around uh, then it becomes more of a tb if it's a thin walled or, or a you know cyst with an imperceptible wall it becomes an emphysematous bulla usually to find a solitary emphysematous bulla is again rare so mm -hmm. you will see some signs of emphysema in the surrounding lung uh, so if you see those signs of emphysema with an emphysematous uh, bulla appearing uh, like a uh, structure then you call it Usually TB cavities are much thicker. So that is one of the uh, most important signs as Dr. Nitin sir also said. Yeah, I totally agree with both uh, Dr. Kushbu and Dr. Nitin. Basically the cavity becomes very, very important. Uh, the size, the, thick, the wall, the thickness of the wall becomes very, very important. So basically in Bulna by definition is less than one millimeter. It's like a hair, it's one millimeter. And usually you cannot see the walls, all the walls of the Bulna. So something is kind of suspicious over there where it's a question mark and you imagine the wall might be going there. Cavity usually is very, very well defined. It's thick walled. But as uh, Dr. Nitin Khushbu both said, sometimes it gets difficult to distinguish. And then you look out for other changes of uh, smoking because Bulla won't alone exist. You'll have other emphysematous changes. But I basically feel that uh, it was a very interesting question. We have one of the questions, uh, Dr. Khushbu, for you. Uh, Dr. Samir is asking, are prone scans mandatory for all? So this is for all CT scans in particular or for obstructive airway disease? Would you like so to? No, prone scans are not a mandate for all. Um, usually they are a mandate for all cases where we are suspecting interstitial lung disease. If a radiologist is not there on the board to look at the images and decide if a prone is needed or not. For airways disease specifically, prone can be easily omitted. Absolutely, absolutely. Nathan, would you like to agree? No, no, perfectly. Yeah, well said. Okay, uh, nice, thanks. We have a very good question from Dr. Somnath Bhattacharya. Again, he's a friend. Uh, this is a difficult question, but a very good question. Maybe both can take, I'll ask Nathan first, or you all decide who wants to answer. Any correlation between pulmonary vascularity score with small airway disease documented by IOS or FOT? Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm very happy living in the zone of IOS plus minus FOT. Uh, I mean, I've been using both the technologies and I'm very happy with them. But uh, the radiological correlation between this and that, to my knowledge, not yet documented uh, Kushbu, if you if you if you know any paper yes, which sir. is doing that but i think you know because this is an emerging and a very disruptive technology is uh, the particularly the ios or uh, FOT is taking the whole pulmonology world by storm and a lot of people are interested in it at the same time we just don't don't have enough correlation between the radiology and this at this point in time no but to my knowledge no sorry no I, sir it, so none none that we know of either for now Okay, we have many, many 
audience questions, I'll just quickly try to. We have a dear friend, Dr. Sudarshan Pothal, who's our ICS governing body. Uh, he's a uh, West Zone chairperson, uh, East Zone chairperson. So, Dr. Sudarshan is asking, what are the indications of HRCT in COPD? So, I think both would like to. Uh, Nitin, why don't you take this? Yeah, I'll take this first. Uh, very frankly, uh, most of the times I would not do it in a mild, moderate kind of a thing, early disease. But if you really ask me, the best value comes in the early. So, you know, somebody who is say obstructed to say 30% FEV1 percentage, and I know it, this man has smoked for 40 years and he is definitely a COPD. And I am seeing every, enough on CT that I am seeing enough air trapping. I really have no value addition by a CT. Whereas a smoker within the first five or 10 years of his life, smoking life, I would say, and if he's shown something really abnormal by a CT, that he's having air trapping, which is not shown on the spirometry. IOS, if suppose, imagine that in your scenario is not available, it's not showing you the air trapping, it's not showing you the subtle obstruction. If it is something like a prism, but I'm able to document emphysema or document something more sinister, I can convince my patient better for A, quitting smoking, B, possibly taking medicines when they are re relevant. Okay, would you like to add anything, Dr. Kushbu? No, ma'am, I can't agree more because indication always the pulmonologist will have to decide. We will Correct. scan the patient. I totally agree with Dr. Nitin. I'd just like to uh, add by saying that if we have a patient of COPD where you're doing everything correct, but if the patient is not getting better, if the breathlessness persists, or if he becomes a recurrent exacerbator, he keeps on getting either an exacerbation or recurrent infections, I would at that time do an HRCT to rule out any underlying bronchiectasis where we know that we have to take partial drainage really seriously, or you want to take up, you want to rule out something coexisting like a TB that you're not aware of, which X-ray is not picking up. So I totally agree with Dr. Nitin that normally HRCT we don't do in a clear-cut patient of COPD, but we definitely do if the patient is not doing well despite the correct therapy or if the patient is getting recurrent infections. Okay, uh, we have a good question from Dr. Ravindra. So he's asking, is there any role of AI, artificial intelligence, in constructing an absolute diagnosis or a most accurate diagnosis? I think maybe Dr. Kushbu should take this. Yeah, yeah. So as of now, none. But yes, AI is coming up big way. It is trying uh, to, you know, uh, supersede a lot of things. A lot of places it has a big role. But the way uh, we realized AI works is that it can always be a help in quantification of a disease. That is describing mild, moderate, severe with more quantum numbers and more objective values rather okay. than being a tool which can be used for diagnosis because solitarily one modality can never diagnose and a diagnosis can never be made only on an HRCT or only on a clinical uh, ground. So only a merger of the two, which as yet AI is difficult. AI can just take up into, you know, one picture at a time. So that that's where AI uh, falls short. So I believe currently we are better, right? The, yeah. currently the Absolutely. knowledge of the radiologists, and uh, I think that is currently, but I think AI is evolving. AI yeah, is evolving. AI is definitely AI is evolving. AI is evolving and dramatically. At the same okay. time, so let me repeat what, no. I, what has been repeated ad nauseum, that no artificial in intelligence is worse than innate stupidity. So exactly. I think clinical, I, I, clinical I can't story. agree more. I can't agree more. Yes. So it can yeah. create blunders. I mean, if 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 not, you know, take in not in the right hands, it can be blunderous. Absolutely, uh, we have you know so many questions coming up. I'm just trying to take most of them. Uh, we have our dear friend Dr. Sushma Dukkar. I mean, she's a lovely friend of mine, and she's a brilliant pulmonologist from Nashik. So let me let me ask you her question. So Dr. Sushma is asking: There are some patients having more changes of bronchiectasis, but they don't have expectoration at all. You know, the bronchiectasis sicka that we spoke to see. Yeah, so, but yeah. they are yeah, breathless. Yeah. So, Dr. Sushma is saying, but they are breathless. What is your line of management? I think it's a fantastic question that she's asked. It's because a great we, clinical question. And one, very frankly, yes. A, you have to focus on bronchodilators. No question about it. You will use a combination of lama and lava, both possibly ultra lama, ultra lava, if that is relevant in that particular patient, or a combination of dual, you know, I mean, two doses in a day 
of a lama lava combination, whatever is more sensible for that patient. I might add even a theophyll in before adding inhaled corticosteroids. Inhaled corticosteroids and a clear cut bronchiectasis, I would really vary because you never know when the infection is going to get harbored into that. And in fact, one of my so called dry bronchiectasis, which is dry for 15 years lands up with a horrible pseudomonas infection and was with us for 15 days on a ventilator. And then, I mean, we were like, you know, wondering whether I made a mistake of adding inhaled steroids two years ago in a very, very tiny dose. And still we were cursing ourselves. So I think that question will always remain one in your mind that whenever you are thinking of inhaled corticosteroids, be a little careful unless until you have documented or you keep on documenting repeatedly absence of a infection which is there chronic bronchial infection then only you are justified in adding inhaled corticosteroids i definitely would not go to oral corticosteroids in almost none of these situations uh, so i agree with dr nitin i just want to add a little more about what i feel i think doing a baseline pf a complete uh, pft is very very important and the thing is that uh, once the PFT shows uh, whether uh, once the PFT shows obstruction, we want to basically start the patients based on amount of obstruction. We'll start with lava, we'll add lama. And the thing is, if on lama and lava, the patient is still breathless, then I would actually do a PFT. And if it's showing reversibility on lama lava, then I would be comfortable adding ICS inhaled corticosteroids. Because you know, in our TOPD webinar, also Nitin, as we know, that all the studies from abroad are saying that. Uh, ICs give rise to pneumonias, but in India, we have not found this at all. So I basically feel that if, uh, despite getting Lama Lava, if the PFT is still showing good reversibility, which is more than 12% and 200 ml in FEV1, then I would be quite happy to add ICs. That was number one. The second thing is that even if they have this- That's, 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 like, that's like an overlap scenario where there is an asthma coexistent with a bronchiectatic uh, Actually, what happens is, you know, with so much of biomass exposure everywhere, we really don't know that, you know, what kind of uh, uh, irritation we are picking up. And other sure. thing I would like to say was that uh, even the patient has dry bronchiectasis, very often it happens that the secretions are so very thick that the patient is not able to really bring them out. And therefore, there are no secretions. So I would definitely uh, like encourage these people to have lots of water. So hot water, uh, three to four liters a day, because it has been found that once you hydrate these patients, the secretions become thin and they start coming out. And I would also okay. either recommend postural drainage or I would definitely recommend these uh, devices, okay. Aerobica, for example, or any of the one that you are comfortable with, because very often they do start bringing out secretions. So I think that though it's so-called dry, we must do this and vaccinations, we must, you know, the flu shot yeah. and the pneumonias. I think this is something that we must do. I think so, so well said, Amita. I think, you know, we, we typically say that difficult to treat asthma versus genuine severe asthma. So is yeah. it true dry bronchiectasis or difficult to expectorate kind of bronchiectasis? So you have to sort out. Absolutely. So our Dr. Very Sushma, a very interesting question. Thank you, Dr. Sushma. I'd like to, um, uh, Dr. Kushbu, I'll ask you now, again, Dr. Prashant Kolte, a dear friend of ours. Can we, Kushbu, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Prashant is asking, can we diagnose airway remodeling on HRCT to rule uh, to rule out uh, in a case of uh, ACR, uh, asthma COPD overlap? So, uh, I think this is a wonderful question. So, the thing is, I told you that very often we have this clinical diagnosis of asthma COPD overlap where patients have symptoms of COPD and asthma both, you know, and then you can't say which one is more. So, you call it ACO, asthma COPD overlap. So, it's a wonderful question that he's asking that can we diagnose airway remodeling on HRCT? I understand that from airway remodeling, we mean that the airway has been diseased and it's an irreversible disease of the airways that we see with uh, the airways uh, a predominant COPD subtype. So predominantly what we will be seeing will be something like bronchiectasis, that is the dilation of the bronchi. So obviously those things we can see on a CT scan. Any changes in the airways which are in the form of dilation of the airways, change in the caliber of the airways, change in the shape of the airways can all be picked up on an HRCT. Yeah. So normally in modeling, we use this word Kushbu mainly for fixed asthma. Nitin, you want to say something? Yeah, I think if, if you remember, Amita, I had shared a paper with you on the bronchial yes. dilatation and the, you know, quantified bronchial dilatation 
predicting the kind of responses, you know, the number of infective with the exacerbations in COPD. So I think that kind of, I know it reminded me of that particular paper, which you, if you remember it. Correct, yeah. So uh, I think it's a very interesting question, but I think as of now, probably we can't, right, Kushbu? No. As of yes, ma'am. So if it's, if we are talking of a reversible airways remodeling, we can't. No. Right. I, I absolutely so, agree. Yeah, so again, I think Dr. Prashant asked a very important question that, you know, about echo, whether we can diagnose echo as such on uh, CT, I think it's more of a clinical diagnosis. I, I, also, I would go clinical combined with the spirometry volume and maybe add iOS to it and in the end add CT, if at all, I, if, if I'm really clueless. Wonderful. So we have again a very good question by Dr. Animesh Arya. Open for both of you all, but I think we should ask Dr. Kushbu first and even Nitin will be happier that way. It's a very hardcore uh, radiology question, but it's extremely interesting. So thank you, Dr. Animesh, for this question. Uh, Kushbu, Dr. Animesh is asking, what is the difference between volume and incremental scan? And can you show an example and if anything not done otherwise? So uh, volume and incremental scan, the way they differ is like... In a volume scan, the entire lung from the apex to base is scanned sequentially. So the scanner moves like this. And the entire lung from apex to base is scanned in a contiguous manner. When you talk about incremental scan, it is the scanner moves tuck, 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 tuck. So there are intervening spaces which are missed. So those gaps are there and you have... Uh, sections taken at uh, certain intervals earlier days when we did not have the helical scanner which moves like this like a helical uh, in those days the incremental scan was done for hrcts which was done with you know four slice uh, eight slice uh, conventional ct scanners nowadays where 16 slice helical ct scan is uh, is is the basic uh, requirement almost everywhere Almost all scans are helical, which are a volume scan acquisition. Totally agree. Absolutely. I, I, I don't think, I mean, the, gone are the days when you are we're looking at, you know, slices taken at, you know, the, as, as she said, you know, at intervals and in between 10 millimeters were completely missed. I don't think that happens anymore. Yeah, agreed completely. Very well said, Dr. Koshbu. Uh, we have again, uh, I'm so happy everybody known to us is posting such lovely questions. So Dr. Swadeep Mishra, our dear friend, he, uh, Kushma, this question I would like to give you first and Nitin can always add if he wants to. So uh, Dr. Swadeep is asking, how useful are low dose CT protocols for airway diseases uh, compared to standard doses? Like so, for example, CA lung, we do low dose. So he's asking that how useful are they for COPD, airway diseases, low dose uh, CT protocol. So they are comparable to a standard CT scan. Obviously, uh, the diagnostic uh, uh, information that we obtain from a low dose is lesser than what we will obtain from a standard dose. But having said that, when we are doing a CT scan for airways disease specifically, we any which ways need an inspiratory and expiratory scan, which means exposing the patient twice to the radiation. Then, you know, doing a low dose inspiration, low dose expiration is absolute no sense. It does not make a sense to, because we try to do a low dose scan, especially like in cancer patients, we said, why? Because we know that we'll be scanning them very regularly or we do it in patients as a screening tool because we know this patient does not need. But when we are doing it for an indication, there is no such benefit of a low dose scan. Agreed. I think very well said. And a very good question by Dr. Swadeep. You know, very, very good question. Uh, we have a very interesting question from uh, Dr. Uh, Shweta from Delhi. Uh, Nitin, I'd like you to take it. Actually, the question is on hypersense and neonitis, but because it involves the airways, let's just take it. Uh, so, Nitin, this question is that how can HRCT findings help guide treatment decisions in hypersense and neonitis? Uh, very frankly, you know, if 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 uh, HRCT is suggestive of a uh, uh, dominant ground glassing and that kind of a story, and the clinical story is very well matching with it, and you have a specific antigen in your mind, uh, and you know, okay, fine, this is a you know, I mean, I mean, a, say a bird fancier, typical bird fancier's lung, 
if you have that story and a good hr city that is that alone is good enough so you don't even have to go to a bronchovalvular lavage or a transbronchial lung biopsy or even a cryo lung biopsy or any further invasive techniques are not necessary if you are not sure about the antigen and if you are not sure about the pattern or more commonly what we encounter in clinical practice is a badly fibrotic hp which looks like a uip again the ct falls short once in a while and you can't differentiate because the dominant pattern is uip like uip like pattern this can hold true for even a ctd ild but more true for hp because we are discussing hp right now hp is uh, sometimes hp uip is so so much overlap that i have seen this that even even on after a biopsy even after a multidisciplinary discussion it's not ruled out completely because you see two or three granulomas and you can't really make sense of the whole story is that a burnt out hp is that a uip is that a uip with few fi few fibrogenic uh, i mean fibrogenic foci will be classical for hp but a few granulomas which are ill defined still present in that conundrum very very tough to sort out so i think once in a while you will come across a very confusing scenario but for majority of your clinical decision making the clinical story radiological pattern not necessarily only hrct even a plain ct can tell you that but an hrct gives you most of the clues is it cellular is it more likely cellular is it dominant ground glassing is there honeycombing or not is there upper lobe uh, dominant or not so all those patterns are uh, in favor of an HP and if you look at that, uh, most of the times your decisions are going to be right. Very there well. is no, yeah, there is no, there is no absolute answer to this. I am sure Kushbu will agree with this that once in a while you you still will be confused at the end I of the story. I totally yes. agree with you. Very very well said. So I basically want to just tell Dr. Shwet, Dr. Shwetak a very important question because now uh, HRCT classification has changed into fibrotic and non-fibrotic. So the thing is that fibrotic, non-fibrotic, we call it based on HRCT and pathological findings. So if a biopsy is now going to be done, then only based on HRCT, we're going to say whether fibrotic or non-fibrotic. And therefore, definitely, if we see a CT which is non-fibrotic, then we know definitely we have to give uh, steroids and do antigen avoidance. And if there's a relapse, then you want to add a second drug like azoran or, uh, I mean, azathioprine or mycophenolate. And of course, if you see fibrotic, then you're not just because there is honeycombing, you will not upfront start antifibrotics for these patients. You will treat them with steroids, with antigen avoidance. And despite treatment, if the patient still progresses in two out of three, whether it is pulmonary, whether it's radiation or function, only then you'll start antifibrotics. So basically, I just feel that with HRCT, hypersensitive monitors right now, uh, we just know so much to treat HRCT, uh, I mean, treat hypersensitive monitors based on HRCT. So I think again, a very interesting question. There are many, many questions. I'm first taking from people who I know. So we have a very good question from Dr. Gitanjali Panda, again, a dear friend of ours, a wonderful pathologist. Nitin, I'd like you to take this question. Uh, Dr. Gitanjali is asking, is there any role of NAC and acetylcysteine in bronchiectasis cases having thick and viscid secretions? Uh, I think it's a million dollar question and the frank answer to it is, no, but at the same time, if you look at the data, which is coming up related to NAC, the NAC data is really looking optimistic when it comes to exacerbations. So if you are really looking at just visits putum and something which you'll expect over it, I would rather go to Amita's, you know, suggestions of hydration. Even if you want to nebulize a bronchodilator, do that, do a good postural drainage, do, do everything before you put on NAC. But if you put somebody on NAC, the benefit may be in terms of exacerbations. And in a person who's exacerbating repeatedly, NAC may be valuable. That is the message in a nutshell. Yeah, I totally agree with Dr. Nitin. Basically, the thing is, if the secretions are thick and viscid, then let's hydrate the patient. And let's basically make sure either we are doing postural drainage or using one of the devices to bring out secretions. However, despite that, if it doesn't help, then definitely we can give NAC, you know, for a short period of time. And there's no harm in that. And if the patient feels better, if he continues, it's okay. But uh, basically, hydration and postural drainage are most important in addition to vaccinations. So very, very good question. There's a question uh, which is uh, from Dr. Yogesh. 
he's asking if no ios is possible i think maybe kushbu should take this because ios is not there so uh, kushbu if the ios that is impulse oscillometry is not possible you know we normally use ios to diagnose small airway disease which you know is not very not very simple to diagnose with spirometry so he's asking because ios is not available everywhere so it's a very good question dr yogesh is asking if ios is not possible due to non availability then any role of ct scan to detect early copd yes so that is what we've been uh, discussing over time that uh, because we realize that there are limitations of spirometry and even the patient being uh, so overtly symptomatic to make the clinical diagnosis up front ct scan does have a role so these air trapping is something which is picked up pretty much early in the course of the disease when there is not so much of architectural distortion in the lung then very early mild emphysematous changes are also picked up before the patient really becomes symptomatic so a lot of these things are picked up uh, before the symptomatology even comes up but okay we... yeah okay great so one more question uh, uh, for dr kushbu then i'll come to nitin so uh, kushbu this question you have answered partly but this is very interesting dr shashki is asking low dose of ct for ca lung screening are there any updates on it anything new is happening on the low dose ct for ca lung very interesting question so uh, yes the newer thing that is happening is that the awareness is increased quite much and people have realized that it's quite a phenomenal tool especially because it detects lung cancer early and at the same time the treatment has advanced so much that if we are detecting the lung cancers early in these stages they can be treated quite much well so the updates are that yes if there the patient has a pack year history of smoking it's a he's above 40 50 years of age then they fall into the category where they should go ahead and do a low dose screening of the lung to detect these nodules okay fine wonderful great so this question we've already taken but uh, it's come again so i'll just ask you nitin so dr vivek is asking is there any role of hrct in diagnosing asthma or deciding severity of asthma uh, i mean once again i think kushbu has been saying a lot of those things about it once in a while you will have a asthmatic who is needing an hrct to be documented to him but if you really ask me asthma is a symptomatic disease very few asthmatics are totally asymptomatic and if i am not having the sensation of obstruction then i would use a more sensitive either a spirometric evaluation or a residual volume evaluation volumetric data or an impulse oscillometry i wouldn't jump to the idea of doing a hrct as a primary tool in an asthmatic for sure uh, in a copd scenario yes because you know it needs much more convincing but asthma is a per, per, symptom at symptom driven disease for people are more symptomatic people are symptomatic even with a normal spirometry for that matter so i think i would rather look at symptoms first oscillometry if the spirometry is failing me second and if i'm absolutely helpless then only i'll look at hrct as the as the tool to go wonderful i completely agree with him very well said so we have about 20 questions still pending but i just want to take this question i liked it very much and it's already 10 20 so maybe this question i can ask to both and uh, keep this as a last question so it's a very interesting question uh, the question is from dr sanali from lucknow she's asking how do factors like age smoking history and occupational exposure influence the interpretation of hrct findings in these diseases i i th i think dramatically yes because we unless until and this information should be fed from us to them very frankly kushbu if she doesn't know anything about anything mm. how is she going to report the whole thing the so patient history like absolutely <laughs> so all, all three all three are important all three are equally important i don't think anything is less important or anything is more important nothing the patient is slightly different no you i i completely agree with you this history is very important the question is not that the question is that the presence of smoking the patient of occupation exposure and age based on this do what do the hrct findings change i think kushbu is the better person to answer <laughs> i have no answer <laughs> <laughs>
you said history is very very important yes so, so the findings we, don't change the interpretation changes uh, we so want if, to know that I uh, think so if we are seeing these uh, if i'm seeing some cystic air spaces in the lung parenchyma for example i know the patient is a smoker i will think of langer and cell cystocytosis if i think if i know the patient is not a smoker then before labeling it as langer and cell cystocytosis i'll think twice similarly if i am seeing some cystic air spaces towards the apices i am seeing some fibrosis towards the bases i know the patient is a smoker i call it a combined pulmonary fibrosis with emphysema if i have a definite history that it's not a smoker and uh, you know a middle aged person i have an occupational history of some you know uh, paint exposure etc then i will go towards a uh occupational lung disease uh, uh more so so obviously i mean the interpretation definitely changes the findings like to call it reticulation bronchiectasis cystic air spaces nodules the findings don't change wonderfully said i think anything would you like yeah. to add i think yeah. fantastic yeah. answer and i think a very good perfect, question perfect answer one more question has come which i want to take though i didn't want to take any more now sir is the last question and uh, this is between for both of you all i think let nitin answer first so nitin the question is that how do you uh, envision the future role of hrct in the uh, sorry uh, how do you envision the future role of hrct in the diagnosis of uh, copd and bronchiectasis with better communication between the pulmonologist and radiologist would it help or not required I, I I think that's the future. I wouldn't stop only at HRCT. I would possibly even consider longit longitudinal data accumulation with MRI. Of course, it's not yet a tool which can be so easily administered to majority of our population because it's a very scary tool. Very frankly, I have a scared shit both the times when I underwent MRIs. But well, if that issue gets taken care of. the kind of noises which are there around you can be taken care of then i think it it can be a wonderful tool so even mri hrct i have no doubt about it i think it these both technologies both imaging technologies put together or in isolation or you know one tops the other whatever happens in future i don't know that i am not a predictor on that scenario but imaging is emerging as important tool to make early diagnosis particularly in copd it will be definitely a game changer in asthma it will probably not be all that required so early in the game but possibly over a period of time we can uh, develop better tools to do that but early copd diagnosis i think definitely imaging is emerging as an important tool as important as io is i would say yes uh, so what do you want to uh, very well said nitin so and also adding on about the communication between pulmonologists and radiologists kushbu is it really good no can't agree more to it because i think we are moving you know from an era like once upon a time there was a single general practitioner who used to do radiology and then diagnose and then treat then came an era where we all started specializing and we started moving on our own tracks where the entire medicine went in for a toss because uh, a pulmonologist will diagnose something the radiologist will write something else and nothing used to fit and i think again we are coming back to an era where we are all working together so now five people combined to become one that becomes a multidisciplinary team and the more the communication is the better it is for the patient absolutely and it puts maybe about 18 questions still remaining but i think we will probably write back the answers because it's already almost 10:25 uh i basically want to say a huge thank you to dr nitin abhyankar dr khushbu both of you all for the fantastic talks of course dr bhavin for a uh, awesome talk and i want to really thank the two of you all for being there for the panel discussion and giving us fantastic fantastic state of the art information and i really like the discussion that both of you all were having and the answers which we have all the time in our minds and while i'm talking more and more questions are coming up i don't know if to take them or not should we or should we wind up should i take two three more I questions think, no no i think wind up wind up because uh, i have okay. to feed my dog <laughs> sorry <laughs> okay great so um okay okay i just want to take this question because it just uh, came up right now so uh, khushbu i'll just finish with this so khushbu dr sujata sardha is asking many times radiologists mention cystic fibro nodular lesions what does this indicate Um, we don't mention anything of this terminology. No, 
you know, so probably she might be facing, you know, she might be having radiologists who write that. I like this question. That's yeah, yeah. Sujata, Sujata comes mean? from Latur and, you know, the, it, it's a second yeah. tier city. So uh, the radiology uh, is different uh, there as compared to diff uh, radiology in Pune and definitely maybe. different from what Kujbu is doing. Yeah, so this, you know, whatever people are known to me, I'm taking all the questions, I'm being partial, but it's so <laughs> tempting, you know, we know the doctor and we want to answer the question. So I so agree with Dr. Nitin as Dr. Sujata is asking. Because very often we see re these reports, cystic fibronodular lesions. What does that mean? Does that mean bronchiectasis sequelae of TB or it's like something abnormal, but we don't know? Do a better quality CT. No, no, ma'am. It just means that we need to see the CT scan to understand what this means. I mean, this is no specific terminology. It's it's a created, it's a created yeah. word. It's a created terminology. Uh, so, it, so it, correct, correct. So probably it needs to be described better. And uh, yeah, I think seen better, ma'am, because it's just and if if needed, a better quality uh, scan needs to be done again, if at all. That's See? That's... Wonderful. So now I'm not going to look at only the question, Chan. So thank you so much, Kushbu and Nitin, for a fantastic panel discussion. A lot of questions that were asked were always in my mind also, and I just feel clinical history, spirometry, along with HRCT, would really help us to provide personalized diagnosis personalized treatment to our patients. You know, COPD not getting better, you did HRCT, there's bronchiectasis. Come on, add in some physiotherapy, add in hydration, partial drainage in your patient will definitely do better. And you know, he might be a recurrent exacerbator because of infection. Similarly, history-wise, COPD, X-ray not so, uh, you know, chest X-ray not saying much, you do a CT and you know this is emphysema. So you know what you're really dealing with. Very often, CPFE, do an HRCT and you actually pick up in an emphysema coexisting IPF. So I basically feel in today's day and age, as we know, history is most important and we know that spirometry cannot be missed out in a patient of obstructive airway disease. I feel in patients of bronchiectasis doing an HRCT is a must. And all your patients of asthma and COPD who are not doing well despite adequate treatment, please do an HRCT because it will always contribute to adding on to some information that you didn't know, which will improve your patient care and will actually give personalized patient care. So with this, thank you so much again to Dr. Nitin Abhyankar and Dr. Kushbu for giving out so much time. Thank you, Dr. Bhavin, Dr. Kushbu and Dr. Nitin for the fantastic talks. I have them all, I heard them all and I'm going to keep on referring to them whenever I have to give a talk on these subjects because they were just so perfect, the talks. A huge big thank you to GSK for being our academic partners. A huge thank you to Dr. Hardik who has been trying his best to coordinate this wonderful session. Also a big, big thank you to uh, entire team GSK. And I would uh, of course like to thank Indian Chess Society for this wonderful initiative of making sure that we are going ahead in our academic march of bringing in knowledge to everybody at the doorstep. Hardik, Sorry. would you like to say something? Yes, ma'am, uh, just a couple of minutes. But uh, as in, I'm not that experienced, but uh, believe me, this was one of the most, most, most amazing discussions I've seen, ma'am. And like, I'm, I feel, I feel privileged to be part of such a, as in amazing meeting. So, uh, first of all, ma'am, on behalf of GSK, I would like to express a sincere gratitude to you, ma'am, because I know all the efforts you've taken to make this uh, meeting extremely successful. And yeah, it really seems that it, it has been extremely successful based on the audience participation. If you would have just taken all the questions, maybe one hour more also wouldn't have been enough, I feel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, secondly, uh, I also want to thank Dr. Pilania and Dr. Abhyankar for this amazing discussion and also Dr. Bhavin Jankarya for an amazing talk that he gave. So, and Basically, we are also incredibly grateful to Indian Chess Society for collaborating with us on this important topic of imaging and airway diseases. Basically, ICS's dedication to improving respiratory health in India is truly commendable, ma'am. And we deeply appreciate your partnership in fostering this, uh, these uh, discussions, ma'am. So hopefully we can have more such discussions in the future as well. And finally, a big, big thank you to all the esteemed uh, doctors in the audience because if not for them, we wouldn't have been having these discussions also, ma'am. So everybody's participations, thoughtful questions have really enriched this discussion. 
So last but not the least, this meeting has undoubtedly contributed significantly to advancing our collective understanding of airway diseases. And we at GSK as well as the ICS are committed to supporting medical adv advancements. And we believe such collaborations are extremely essential for better pa patient outcomes. So all in all, I just, I'm a very humble thank you to everybody, Dr. Abhyankar, Dr. Pilania, most importantly, Dr. Nene, Dr. Jankaria. Thank you, thank you, thank you from GSK. And thank you. Uh, have a good night, everyone. Right. And then thank you, Dr. Samir and Dr. Yogesh Mani, Dr. Samir Arzule also, and the techno team for helping me join in. So thank Sorry. you so much. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. There is a small poll at the end of the yes. uh, this thing. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, so ma'am, there's a small poll for the audience in the chat box. So kindly, uh, I would request the audience to fill that poll and also the feedback uh, for the webinar, ma'am. Wonderful. Sure. So thank I'm you. sure, you know, thank we have wonderful yes, yes. doctor friends who are doing brilliant work and who are always uh, so proactive in learning new things. So a huge big thank you to each of y'all for joining in. It'll be wonderful if you do the poll and give us a feedback. That'd be wonderful. So thank you with this. I'd like yeah. to say goodbye to everybody. Thank you so much. Good night. Goodbye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. Hi, Dr. Samir. I think they're still relaying. Has the relay stopped? Abhijit? 